All right, we are going to get started. So welcome everyone. I'm Megan. I'm the Nutrition Field Specialist with SDSU Extension. And we are so excited and I guess sad um, also um, to have you join us for the, our last Food Preservation at Home series. So um, if you're new, welcome. If you've been with Hope and I over the course of, gosh, it's been since June, over the last nine sessions, um, welcome back. And um, we just hope that you gain even more knowledge on food preservation. And so today, Hope and I are going to be talking on, oopsie, there, back it up. We're gonna be talking on canning meats. Um, so if you are able, so just type in the chat box, just share with us your location. Um, do you can meats? And I guess I'm curious if you do can meats, what kind of meat? Uh, and if you wanna put in your favorite um, session that you attended, uh, if you attended all of them, what was your favorite? Um, if this is just your first, maybe this will be your favorite. Um, yeah, your favorite session of the Food Preservation at Home series. Awesome, I see Jim can some fish occasionally. That's impressive. Awesome, thanks Jeanette. Wonderful, yeah, so keep on. And if you haven't canned meats yet, maybe this will even just inspire you to start canning meats and maybe not be so intimidating. All right. So there were some questions that were submitted during registration. Um, Hope and I will hopefully address those during our live session. But if you have any that come up during um, our, our talk, please feel free to type those in our chat box. And we are gonna go ahead and get started. All right, so I am going to introduce myself and Hope before we kind of get on with our uh, presentation. So like I said, my name is Megan Erickson and I am a nutrition field specialist based in the Aberdeen Regional Center. And I share my knowledge as a registered dietitian nutritionist to help support individuals and families live a lifestyle balance with healthy nutrition and physical activity practices. And I would have to say my favorite preserved meat is jerky. And Hope Klein is a health education and food safety field specialist. She's based in Brookings. And Hope serves South Dakotans by helping individuals and communities implement healthy living interventions. And as a certified exercise physiologist, her programming focuses on exercise, healthy communities, and her knowledge on food preservation. Hope grew up canning with her father her entire life and has followed in his footsteps with growing her own garden and preserving her own food from peaches to green beans and to deer. So she loves to can meat. And before we um, get going, we do have a poll. Let me, there we go. So Hope has put the poll up. So if you would share your knowledge on current practices for, day, for today's home food preservation topic. So canning meat, your knowledge on it. All right. Wonderful. So we have lots to learn. So hopefully I have no doubt after this that your confidence will increase. All right. Our next question that we're going to share with you is your ability to follow safe practices for today's home food preservation topic. So your ability to follow safe practices in regards to canning meat. Great. Again, a little more confidence, but we we will get we'll get you guys all following safe practices with canned meat. All right. And our last question is knowing where to go for safe research tested recipes for preserving food using today's topics. Again, canning meat. Oh, 
Wonderful. And if you've attended our sessions before, I bet you already know that we're to go for a research tested recipe. So that's great. We'll even get you a little bit more confident. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and get started. So canning meats, we are only talking about pressure canning because that's what you need to do when canning meat. So just to destroy botulism spores, low acid foods, which meat is considered a low acid food, must be processed at temperatures higher than the boiling point of water. And then therefore this is done only, this can only be done by surrounding jars of food with pure steam under pressure. So food, the meat in the jars can't simply be heated enough by water bath boiling. We, it needs to be pressure canned. And canning, you know, is a great method to preserve and extend shelf life for many types of foods such as meat. And using safe preparation and storage practices allows us, or allows anyone really, to store nutritious high quality protein. Um, it's important to practice and with meat, say food handling, storage, um, preparation techniques, just because contaminated food will not be safe to eat following canning. So currently there are safe recommendations for canning poultry, seafood, red meats, and some meat products such as um, meat and like other vegetable soups. All right, so this is kind of a guide for our the approximate, so how much do meat do you need per, um, depending on what type of jars you use. So this is approximate pounds of meat per jar. So depending on what kind of meat and the cut, so if you're doing, you know, beef, is it round or rump? Um, are you doing pork loin? Are you doing chicken? Um, chicken with bones, without bones? Um, so if you were to do chicken with bones, if in pint jars you would need one and three quarters to two pounds of meat per jar versus it would be obviously be a little bit more if you're doing quarts. So this is just kind of a great guide to give you an idea of how many jars um, you would need before you start processing. All right, I know if you've attended our other sessions, we've touched on raw pack and hot pack, um, but if not, you know, there's two methods of packing your jars. Um, raw pack is simply exactly what it says. Meat, your meat is raw, it's not heated, it's put directly into your hot jars. It's packed loosely with raw meat pieces and you wanna leave appropriate head space. And you do not add any liquid with raw pack. Now, hot pack, on the other hand, your food is heated to boiling, so your meat is heated. So boil, steam, or bake meat until about two-thirds done, so this is considered a rare. Um, you don't want your meat medium or, you know, well done, you know, just about two-thirds done. You'll pack your jars loosely with the hot pieces, pour hot broth, um, leaving, again, that appropriate headspace. And then for ground meat, you wanna remove excess fat, cover with either boiling meat broth, tomato juice or water, depending on what your recipe calls for. And again, leaving appropriate head space. And I know um, I mentioned head space quite a few times, so I feel like I need to explain what that is. And so head space is, and you can see the picture at the top, the space in the jar between the bottom of the lid and the top of the food or your liquid. Again, it varies by type of food. Um, your low acid foods, such as your meats, it's gonna be anywhere between one inch to one and a quarter inches. So again, look at your recipe. Um, in that proper headspace is what's gonna create that vacuum seal and just make for a success rate, a good success rate in all of your jar sealing and then making sure that none of them spoil. Um, so you wanna make sure if you have too little headspace, so if you have more liquid or meat, like all the way to the top, that's gonna seep over the edges and that liquid isn't gonna create a good seal because there's gonna be liquid now in between the lid and the top of rim of your jar. Um, so again, look at your tested recipe and check to see what your headspace is. Okay, so time is very important. So the food may be at food safety risk if you under process it. 
So this can happen by many different reasons. Um, so failing to take into consideration the size of the jar. Um, so whether you're pint or quart size, you know, the bigger the jars, you may have to process them a little bit longer. Um, you process for fewer minutes than specified. So maybe you were in a rush and just like, oh, five or 10 minutes is it gonna make a big deal? It does. Um, and every canned food has its own processing time. So follow tested recipes. Remember in pressure canning, your heat up and cool down times and pressure canners are counted towards ster the sterilization value um, in that process. All right, so in here are a couple tables depending on what kind of meat you are canning. So um, the top table is kind of your meats, your beef, pork, venison, if you're into canning bear, lamb, or veal. So um, depending on raw or hot pack, if you're doing pints or quarts, there's the processing time on the right hand side. And then our poultry, there's with bones and without bones. And again, it makes a difference in your processing time and how long um, that you have your um, pounds of pressure for pressure canning. And our last table here is fish. So um, I know Jim had mentioned he had canned fish. So this is likely one that he's been referencing. So raw pack, um, pint size is typically about 100 minutes. All right, and we're gonna switch gears now and Hope is gonna dive into the different kinds of pressure canners. Yes, thank you, Megan. I am just quick putting in the chat box um, a link to two different articles that we have on our SDSU Extension website. That's actually where the tables that Megan just showed us came from. So um, we have two different articles, one on canning meats and then the other one on canning fish, just because there is uh, some different guidelines with canning those items. So here you can see that there are dial gauge pressure canners and weighted gauge pressure canners. Um, with canning meat, this goes for any any food that you're going to can, but meat especially, it's important to use the right equipment. Only a pressure canner is able to reach the high temperature that is necessary to kill the harmful bacteria in meat. With water bath canning, um, which you use for high acid or acidified foods, you're not gonna reach the required temperature that's suitable for canning meat. So for water bath canners, you can reach a temperature of 212 degrees, Whereas with pressure canners, they can go up to 240 as they heat by the pressure and steam that builds up inside of that pressure canner. So just always make sure you're using the correct equipment. So on the next slide, we'll dive a little bit further into the weighted gauge. So the weighted gauge pressure canner works by exhausting tiny amounts of air and steam each time that the gauge or the weight on top of the vent port rocks or jiggles during processing time. You, the weighted gauge pressure canner needs less monitoring during processing time. And um, unlike the dial gauge pressure canner, which we'll be talking about in just a minute, the weighted gauge does not need to be checked for accuracy each year. Typically you're looking for one to four little um, jiggle movements per minute, which will indicate the correct pressure is achieved. So either that five, 10 or 15 pounds of pressure, but of course, always look at your manual as this can vary from model to model. And then we have um, a link right here in the slide, which we can share. Um, actually, I'll just share that now quick. And it's a short little video that shows you a pressure canner, a weighted gauge canner, where the weight is just jiggling like crazy and it's showing you that it's above the desired pounds of pressure. And then it shows you immediately after kind of that correct jiggle movement that you're wanting to achieve. So I just put that YouTube link in the chat box for you all um, if you want to open that up and view it after this session. All right, and then going on to dial gauges. So as I shared, a weighted gauge does not need to be tested for accuracy each year, but a dial gauge must be checked for accuracy. So gauges that read high can cause underprocessing in food, as well as gauges that read low can um, 
because over processing in food. So both can result in unsafe product in your canning jar. So for example, one pound of error in a 20 minute processing time can cause a 10% decrease in sterilization value and a two pound error results in a 30% decrease. So this is really important because you don't know if you're getting your food up to that 240 degree mark because you don't know if your pressure is where it needs to be for the food that you are preserving. So Extension does have an article where there are current locations in South Dakota that test dial gauge canners. These are at no cost and all you need to do is bring your lid in. You don't have to bring the whole pot. And um, like there's one in Sioux Falls and that's like, it's the same day most of the time where they can just test it for you really quick and send you on your way. However, the location in Watertown, they actually mail it to their Minnesota location. So if you utilize the Watertown location, you just need to make sure um, that you know that you're not gonna be able to go home with your lid. Okay, so now we're gonna dive deep into canning meats. Um, and first I'm gonna be just talking about canning strips, cubes, and chunks of meat. So not necessarily talking about ground meat yet. We'll get there in just a moment. Um, but the texture and flavor of your meat is going to depend on the breed, the feed, and the manner of handling the meat when it was harvested. So what you wanna do is remove fat, gristle, and any bruised meat. This is just going to result in better quality of your um, canned product. Then you hot or raw pack, always follow the directions based on the meat that you are canning as there is some variation on what the best recommendation is. Hot pack is best um, and salt is optional. It is only for flavor. Um, some additional tips that we have. So for if you're canning wild game, so this would be like your venison and I caught, I, I've I can venison each year and it's my favorite kind of meat. Um, so I know, Megan, I think you shared that you like preserved jerky for your meat, um, whereas I preferred canned venison, which this is an image of some canned venison. This is fresh out of the canner. Um, I should have thought to put a picture of canned venison after it has sat because the fat floats to the top and you have like an inch worth of white fat layered on top and that is normal um, once it has cooled off. But some tips for canning wild game to avoid the off flavors. So a lot of people will say like, oh, well, there's a gamey taste. Um, trim the visible fat. So venison, for example, you don't really want to can the fat it, uh, that a venison that a deer has on them. Whereas like when you're canning beef, it's good to keep some fat because that's going to help with flavor in the preservation process. And it's best to age the carcass at 40 degrees or less for two to three days. So a lot of hunters, you know, they'll skin and gut their deer and then they'll have them hang, um, which is really beneficial. And then after you uh, cut your meat off of the carcass and you either cut it into cubes or strips, um, this is something that I do is I do soak mine for one hour in brine water containing one tablespoon of salt per quart of water. And that just helps with that gamey taste. So rinse it well once you have it um, soak in that brine for one hour. And then as I stated with deer, I remove all of the fat off of the deer and I actually add animal fat to it. So I add in pork fat. It is very inexpensive um, at any of your local lockers, they'll be able to get you some pork fat. And I typically do like a one to four or one to five ratio. As I said, fat helps aid in the preservation process and then it also adds flavor to the end product. So um, if you've been interested in canning venison, it actually doesn't taste much different than like a canned beef product, especially if you're utilizing something like pork fat. Um, and like I'll make beef stew or whatever and no one will know that it's canned venison. They just think that it's beef. Okay, so then now moving on to talking about ground meat. Uh, you wanna use fresh chilled meat. You can shape it into patties or balls, or you can just simply um, brown it like ground beef, like you would for barbecues. Um, but you only want to like lightly brown it. So there is some cooking required of um, your meat, your ground beef before you can it. So you wanna brown it so it's just slightly browned, about 70% done. So you're not completely cooking the meat. You wanna hot pack it only. And as Megan mentioned earlier, you do want to remove that excess fat. And then you'll pack it with um, like boiling water or broth or the tomato juice. 
And then next, talking about canning either meat or poultry stock. So if you're making your own broth um, from some of the animal product that you have, you want to cook the bones um, and then remove the meat off of the bones, cool the broth, add the meat back, um, let it cool, and then you can skim the fat layer um, off of the top of that of your pot. And then you want to hot pack it, and it does have a shorter processing time um, when you hot pack it. So that's going to save you some time in the long run. Moving on to canning fish. As I shared in the chat box, I personally have never canned fish. I would love to. Um, I typically freeze our fish just because we don't get, we're not as good of a fisherman as Jim is, I guess. Uh, we don't ever have a big enough catch to make it worth our time to can it. So we just freeze the fillets. But there are specific fish that are suitable for canning. Um, those include catfish, northern pike, salmon, smelt, and trout. There are a number of fish that are not suitable for canning at this time. There's just not the evidence base behind them to state that they are safe. So those include your crappies, perch, bass, walleye, and then other pike. Those are best preserved by freezing. And then um, if you are to can fish, you clean the fish um, for the best nutritional quality, nutritional value, cleaning them within two hours of catching is best. Of course, this isn't always practical. Um, just a good note that we wanted to share with you. Remove the internal organs, skin the fish, remove the bones and fat. Keep cold until you're ready to can it. Um, if, if it's frozen first, then just thaw it in the refrigerator. Your processing is different for your pints versus your quarts. So I don't mean just the processing time. I mean the processing process in general is going to be different. So just make sure that you are following an evidence-based recipe when you are canning your fish. You can soak them in a salt brine. Um, so this is one cup of salt per one gallon of water for one hour and then draining them well. And then you can cut them into sizes appropriate for the canning jar size. So if you're gonna do it in a pint, you can just um, cut it in strips, the length of a pint jar. And you wanna store your fish no longer than two days before canning. So I actually should have moved that bullet up a little bit. Um, so as I said, keep your fish cold until you're ready to can it, but don't store it for any longer than two days before canning it or throw it in the freezer until you're ready to can it. Fatty fish are to be loosely packed with no added liquid. And your fatty fish would include uh, your catfish, your northern pike, salmon, trout, and smelt. All right, and then um, touching on preserving poultry or rabbit. Um, for meats such as chicken, rabbit, duck, or goose, you can cut them into strips or cubes. You have the option to hot pack or raw pack. If you're going to raw pack, you can just put the meat directly into the canning jars um, with one teaspoon of salt per quart. If you're going to hot pack, you boil, steam, or bake the meat until about 70% done, and then pack into canning jars with meat stock and one teaspoon of salt per quart. You want to leave a one and a fourth inch headspace, and then always remember to wipe the rim of your canning jar clean, just so you can ensure um, nice clean contact um, to help with your seal rate. Um, that's actually my daughter and husband, and my daughter is very proud of that pheasant that she got to watch her dad shoot. Um, but you know, we just let her think that she, you know, she gets full credit for that. <laughs> All right, and then now we're gonna talk about um, the process of pressure canning. So if you were able to be on our session where we covered pressure canning, this is gonna be a reminder. If you weren't able to be on that, this is gonna go through the process of how do you use a pressure canner. Megan will be sharing in the chat box in just a moment, a video that we've actually created this summer um, that shows you step-by-step -step how to use a weighted gauge pressure canner. So the first step is to put about two to three inches of hot water in the canner. Um, that's a general guide. Again, looking at your instruction manual for your pressure canner, it might tell you, you know, some say like put in two quarts of hot water or some will say put in two inches of hot water. So just make sure that you're looking at your instruction manual. Once you have your jars packed, uh, you wanna lift the jar straight up and straight down into the canner. You don't want to tilt it from side to side as this can cause the food or the liquid to spill into the sealing component, which can of course hinder your sealing rate. And then the next step is to leave the weight, if you're using a weighted gauge, um, a weight off of the vent port or open the pet cock of a dial gauge pressure canner. Heat your heating element at the highest setting until steam flows freely from the open pet cock or vent port. 
And then while keeping that high heat, you want to let that steam flow continuously for 10 minutes. This is also called exhausting the pressure canner. And then after that 10 minute time frame, you place the weight on the vent port or close the pet cock. And the importance of letting your pressure canner exhaust is to just pull out that cold air and let the steam build up inside of your pressure canner. So that's going to provide you with the best results and the safest results. Then moving on, um, you wait for, after you put on the weight or close the pet cock, you wait for your pressure to build up. So you're waiting for your needle on your dial gauge to either indicate the correct pounds of pressure or you're waiting for your weight to start jiggling. At that point, you can start the timing process. And um, when you've reached this, it is okay to turn down the heat a little bit as long as you maintain um, that correct pressure. Of course, you don't want to have overpressure um, in your food. So just make sure that you're regulating your heat um, to make sure you're maintaining that steady pressure at or slightly above what you are wanting according to your recipe. And then just to note that quick and large pressure variations during processing can cause unnecessary liquid losses from jars. So I know that this is something that we get calls on too of like, oh, well, I can't for the sake of this presentation, I'll just say um, cubed beef and one of my jars like liquid was halfway down the jar. Um, and it might be because they had quite a bit of variation in their um, pressure. Always follow the canner's manufacturer's directions for how a weighted gauge should indicate it is maintaining the desired pressure. So again, um, generally it's one to four of those jiggles per minute, but it does vary from canner to canner. Then when your processing time is complete, you want to turn off the heat and remove the canner um, from the heat if possible, just to help the canner depressurize. If you're uncomfortable lifting up your canner um, while it is full and it is hot, it is fine to leave it on the heating element. It will just take a little bit longer for your canner to come down from pressure naturally. And in step eight, you'll see the note of do not force cool the canner. This can result in unsafe food or food spoilage. Um, the standard canner can, will require 30 to maybe 45 minutes to naturally depressurize. Um, so you don't want to force cool it. And by force cooling, we mean like maybe you take the weight off so all the steam and pressure will come out of that vent port. Or you don't want to like put your canner um, in cold water or ice water to help it cool down faster. Um, because the sterilization value of the food will be compromised if you're doing that because the heat up and cool down times of any canning method are counted toward um, the evidence base that the recipe is tested and safe. So you just always want to make sure that you have the time for pressure canning when you pressure can because it does take a bit longer than water bath canning. So after your canner is depressurized, you want to remove the weight from the vent port and then you want to wait 10 minutes um, just to let the inside of your canner start to naturally cool down as some of that heat escapes the vent port. After 10 minutes, you can then take your lid off. Make sure you're lifting it or tilting the lid away from you so you don't get steam built up in your face. And then you wait um, five minutes and then you can, it's safe to remove your jars um, using a jar lifter because your jars are going to be hot and then place them on a towel, leaving at least one inch spaces between the jars before, um, or to allow them to help cool. And then you want the jars to sit undisturbed for 12 to 24 hours at room temperature. All right, we are going to switch um, gears. Hope kind of went through the process. So before you even just start um, thinking about pressure canning, you always want to look up your altitude depending on where you are and where you live and you have to adjust for altitude. So if you recall water bath canning, we just add minutes to the processing time. For pressure canning, you need to increase your pounds of pressure. Um, so we show a map here of South Dakota. And so depending, you know, where you live, you know, East River, West River, up in the mountains, um, down in a valley. So you may need to adjust um, your altitude. So this next table kind of shows you, so depending on if you have a weighted gauge or a dial gauge, um, if you're above a lot, 
several places in South Dakota are above a thousand feet. So say um, I'm in Aberdeen and I think we're about 1300, our altitude is about 1300. So if I were to use a weighted gauge, I would need to process at 15 pounds of pressure. And if I use the dial gauge, I would need to um, process at 12 pounds of pressure. So, um, and again, we Hope touched on if there is an error in pound just by one or two, it can um, decrease the quality and sterilization even of your product. So make sure that you are adjusting for altitude. All right, so you have gone through, you've filled your jars, put them in your pressure canner, gone through the long process of heating, cooling, um, all the above. So the best next thing is checking to make sure um, it's sealed. And sometimes you can even hear that ping um, that a lot of us keep um, experience canners, it's music to our ears. Um, but sometimes with it pinging doesn't necessarily mean that it's sealed. So after the cooled jars, um, or the jars have cooled 12 to 24 hours, remove the screw bands and then test the seals with one of these options. Of course, you know, the most common is just pressing um, the middle of the lid with your finger. If it springs up when you release, it's not sealed. Um, tap the lid with the bottom of a spoon. A dull sound, the lid is not sealed. If it's a high pitched sound, that means you have a good seal. I've done this test before and I have found a couple jars, unfortunately, um, that made that dull sound and they were not sealed. Um, another option is just holding it at eye level and looking across and the lid should kind of slightly curve down um, in the center. If the center of the lid is flat or bulging, it may not be sealed. So again, those are some different options to check for um, sealing. And signs of spoilage. So these were <laughs> these bullets. I mean, they don't even sound good. Um, a, you know, a bad seal, improper color, rising air bubbles, foam leaking, unnatural odors, mold growth, slimy texture. So even if you know they look like they've sealed and you store them even before you use them check for signs of spoilage um, smell all of that lid becomes unsealed with no signs of spoilage could mean pathogens are still present um, and hope and i always say when in doubt throw it out that's kind of our motto we would rather you be safe um, and not get any kind of food poisoning so these are just some some other things to think about um, when using your canned foods. All right, so as I shared earlier, um, I always enjoy canning venison and I grew up canning beef with my dad. Um, so I grew up on canned meat and it's really entertaining because some people, when you say like, oh yeah, I can meat, they're like, that's so gross. And I mean, look at this picture. It doesn't look very pretty by any means. So I can understand where people are coming from. Um, but I think it was Jean that also shared um, canned meat is it's so good. It's so tender. It's flavorful. It's oh, you just have to try it. But the question that I get all the time is, OK, but like, what do you do with your canned meat? So um, some different ways I just wanted to share how I have used canned meat. Um, using it, especially in the fall for like a good beef stew recipe is really great. It's so, so easy because you just have to boil it um, with some, I just use water. Some people might use like beef broth or something like that, but I just add um, like a quart of the canned meat and then about a quart to a quart and a half of water with it. And then um, I'll simmer that up with some potatoes and carrots. And it's just a super easy one pot meal. Um, and who's, who's going to complain about that? Um, you can even use it for stir fries. You can use it for like beef pot pies. And this can either be like cubed canned meat or if you can ground beef. Um, you can use it in burritos, tacos, cheesesteak sandwiches. I just always think of like if you get a cheesesteak sandwich or like a prime rib sandwich at a restaurant and how tender and soft that meat always is. So this is going to achieve that nice um, same tender 
tenderness um, that you get at a restaurant commonly. And then there can be different like pasta recipes um, or, you know, maybe there's other ideas. So I, I would love it if anybody would be willing to share in the chat box how you've maybe used your canned meat. Okay, really quick, I just wanted to provide a tiny bit of information on drying meats. So the session two weeks ago was on dehydrating. So we talked about dehydrating fruits and vegetables, and then we did go a little more in depth on like canning jerky. But I specifically wanted to just touch on canning wild game or not canning, I'm sorry, drying wild game. So a few key points that I wanted to share on drying meats is that you need to take into consideration the wound like wound location. Um, you know, so if you're a hunter and you get a deer this year, you wanna think about, okay, where was the wound location at? When I was cleaning my deer, did any of the meat come into contact with contents of the gut or fecal bacteria? And if it has been, if this has happened, you only want to utilize the meat in ways that it's thoroughly cooked. So with drying your meats, um, you aren't necessarily fully cooking the meat. You want the meat to get up to a higher temperature. So for those meats, you wouldn't want to dry it. Um, so with making like venison jerky or something like that, just make sure that you're utilizing meat from your deer that has not come into contamination with other areas. Okay, so that really brings us to the end of our presentation on canning meats. Um, we encourage you to either unmute yourself to ask any questions that you might have or to go ahead and put them in the chat box and Megan and I would be happy to answer them. Or even if you just wanna share how you use canned meat, that would be great too. Hi, this is Jeanette and Vermillion and I have a story. I, I love it. <laughs> I turned 70 last month and one of my biggest memories from being a kid, one of my most vivid is canning meat up on my grandma's farm, which is a little farm outside of Viberg. That house had no running water and we ca I can picture it. We, we canned outside. I remember them burning the pin feathers off of the chickens. And then I remember all, the meat was so good. The canned meat was so good, but by some miracle, grandma and mom didn't poison us. But <laughs> I mean, this was well water and the whole thing. But anyway, so that's my canned meat memory. Oh, thank you for sharing that. That is so great. I love hearing stories like that. And what good memories. It, it was. It was. It's a way to remain. You know, the farm. The farm isn't even there anymore. It's a plowed field now. So it's. It, but it's such. It's so nice to be able to picture that day. Must yeah. have made a big impression on me at the time. Yeah, definitely. And happy birthday. Happy oh, late birthday. <laughs> All right, Jim has a tip for us, which I love because I'm no expert on canning fish. Um, so he lived on the Oregon coast for years and had access to albacore tuna and salmon. Oh my gosh, my mouth just watered. Uh, smoked canned fish is great. I have heard that. But if you smoke it, do that very, very lightly before you can. He learned this the hard way because smoking is a preservation process itself. Smoke it lightly just for the flavor before canning. Great. That's really good to know. Jim, I think I need to invite myself over to your place so you can teach me more on smoking and canning fish. <laughs> All right, um, we'll give you a couple more minutes yet to see if anybody else has questions or anything else that they want to share, but we'll go ahead and launch that same poll that you saw at the beginning of the session. Um, but if you have questions, just put them in the chat box. Okay, so here, um, this is the first question that you had at the beginning of today's session. So how, how would you say your knowledge is on canning meat? Or how confident do you feel? Waiting on one more to vote. Oh, 
Okay, well, I'm very happy to see where we're at. Um, at the beginning of today, we had one person that was confident or very confident and then four people that were not confident at all. So that is wonderful for Megan and I to see. All right, next poll. How confident are you in your ability to follow safe practices for canning meat? This was one where we had three individuals state that they were not at all confident and we have increased our confidence level, which is wonderful. And then the last question that we have, this one I know we had a higher confidence level in before, but maybe it's still gone up a little bit. Um, and if you missed it, I did put in a direct link to the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Um, they have a page where you can put like, how do I can, and then they have different um, URLs that pop up. So I put in the URL where it directly shows you or discusses how to properly can different kinds of meat. Um, so that's really helpful as all of the, the kinds of meat, there's so much variation that it's hard for Megan and I to tell you specifically, this is what you do, because there's just a lot of different factors. Okay, great. Awesome. All right, so that concludes our food preservation at home series. Um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to Hope and I, and I am just dropping our contact information um, in the chat box as well, but it's also on your screen. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Um, the past few weeks all the way back since June and these are recorded so we will um, so if you've missed any of them of them or want to go back and rewatch um, we will be sending out a full list and links of the recordings of all of the nine sessions that Hope and I have done so thanks again and happy preserving and happy first day of fall thanks everyone Jessica, did you see my chat back to you? No, hold on, let me check, thank you. Yes. I'm doing this on my phone today and it's, I'm so much more used to my uh, laptop, so. Oh, yeah, I just said that if you wanted to drop your email to me, I can send you a couple of resources. Okay, good, I was actually just gonna try, I was just gonna send you an email because I thought, I'll just email her so she can respond. So I will just send you an email. Okay. Um, so I actually, I've been struggling with, with two different things. I have been trying to find recipes for, I'll let you actually see my face. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I have been trying to find recipes for spaghetti sauce, some sort of a pasta sauce, either with or without meat. I don't even care, but I can't find any that are like safe or listed. So that, and then also um, tomato soup. I just wanted to have some tomato soup that I could just have canned. And I don't know if it's, the one thing I was just reading said something about if you're making soup, you just pressure can it. But I still feel like there has to be a safe recipe for it, right? Yeah. Um, so I know there, there's a ball recipe I'm thinking of that has, um, like a spaghetti meat sauce recipe. So I'll just have to dig to try to find that. I can't remember if there's one on the National Center for Home Food Preservation site. So I'll have to do some digging. Um, as far as the tomato soup, if I'm being 100% honest, this is my first year canning tomato soup. Um, my dad's always canned tomato soup, but like he does his thing and I'm not okay with doing that myself. <laughs> um, so this year, what I actually did was I just canned, um, 
the tomato juice and then I'm going to mm. utilize that to like turn it into a soup just because when you're doing soups something a lot of people want to do is they want to put in those thickeners like the corn starch or whatever to give it the not just pure liquid texture um and with canning you don't want to add those thickeners and then can okay. it because it's going to mess up the heating process when you're canning okay. it um so I can do some digging too on the tomato soup unless Megan you can you think of any off the top of your head no, I'm just looking as you guys are um, chatting. The National Center for Home Food Preservation just has general soups and you prepare them um, initially with the vegetables, but like copia, you don't add any of the flour, any of the, those thickeners because it's not going to be safe. If you do, um, a lot of people do just freeze. Like my cousin has a great spaghetti sauce recipe and I just free, I love it, but I just, I don't know, just because I know what I know, like Hope said, I prefer to freeze it and it's turned out great, um, but she cans it. So if there is something, but you can always add like those extras at the end to add mm -hmm. a little bit more flavor, um, but just following that first tested recipe. But yeah, we can do some digging and I know there's some good ones out there. Well, and what's Thank nice you. too, yeah, sorry, one more thing and then we'll let you go. Me and Megan, like, we could just talk forever about <laughs> canning, so you might have to cut us off. Um, but the other thing too, like, why I like just canning, like, the tomato juice is because then, like, I have, I can do my own recipe. Like, I can do whatever I want mm -hmm. with it because mm -hmm. I'm not risking the safety of canning it because I'm just canning it as juice. And it's so easy to just, like, throw some things in there in the pot and warm it up. Um, so it's still convenient, um, but yeah. So yeah, shoot me and or Megan an email and then uh, we can send you some direct links. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, thanks for joining. Thanks, Gail. And thanks, Janine.